I've shown this uh, appendix uh, E2, Basic Terrestrial Flora and Fauna Assessment Stage 1, for DA 21-0010, in a previous video. And I've also brought up the fact that it uh, its position on where this these database records are taken from is not adequate enough to describe the environment that is actually around the nightcap on Minjimbal development. So I'm just going to show you this was the next page on this is uh, page 72 of Appendix E2 and giving their coordinates for where they actually put in for that test result. Now here they've said that they had 321 records of 54 species. Now there were several things that were abundantly clear when you just even glance at the overall three appendixes that actually cover the flora and fauna. And one of them is, well, there are hundreds and hundreds of species in that area and many of them have to be protected. So in your data analysis, why is it not based on the very basic classifications that animals are and flora and fauna are put into, whether they're endangered, vulnerable, unprotected? And many of them are protected, but are not listed as endangered or vulnerable, but they are still a protected species. So instead of being a complete flora and fauna assessment, it's wound up to be only catering for those that may be endangered or vulnerable. And it doesn't tend to cater for any others that are actually protected or that heavily rely on the environment that they are in for their survival. So using these exact coordinates, and the thing about the coordinates that when you plug them in, because it is a 10 kilometre square minimum area that you're surveying, sometimes if you wanted it to come more one side, it chops off too much on the other side because one degree uh, takes up a lot. And you can't really refine it in certain circumstances to the actual area that you want. But in doing so anyway, putting in their exact coordinates, their return of threatened species is 321 records of 54 species. And that's on the 3rd of December 2019. So doing it now in 2021, it is going to be inclusive of any sightings that or records that have been made since then. But generally, you would only have more species that would be added to the list if there were sightings of them. You would not have records disappear of sightings because these are valid records. They are not invalid records that they would then take out because it's confusing the matter. So this overlay here is the fauna corridor plan. The one marked in orange is the proposed one and the green one comes through here. Now there's actually several issues that when you look at the test area for what's in that habitat that it actually involves two natural boundaries that they say that the wildlife corridor comes over here. Well, in essence, there might be sightings on this side and sightings on this side, but it would not actually be a continuous corridor because there are two natural barriers. One of them is the river. Now, most animals that are in this area are going to stay on that side of the river. 
there's no need for them to cross when there's all this abundance because even if they do cross the river they're going into open fields and the next natural barrier they've got is a busy road so the inclusion of anything on this side of the Kyogle Road and the Tweed River is including um, sightings and habitat that has already got one natural barrier and one man-made barrier of a busy road. So the chances of animals actually this being a continuous corridor is actually very slim. The corridor would stop here at the natural barrier of the river and the secondary barrier of the road. So if you're going to actu accurately um, survey the animals within the development area, you would need to take them in context of the overall environment and ecosystem that they are part of. They are not actually part of an ecosystem that has to cross two boundaries or barriers. It is a completely separated, separated um, ecosystem in that sense. That because of these two big obstacles, animals are going to avoid it. Uh, yes, you will get your wallabies that will um, cross the bridges and cross the roads. Everybody experiences this roadkill, but for the most part, they're going to stay back. They may come down into the lower fields if they've crossed the river. But the whole ecosystem that animals rely on in this part is part of this larger area. This ecosystem up here, it is separate to what is involved down there. So then I, once I realized that, well, look, you do actually need to look at animals in this area are going to wander all over the place. This, let's just say this is a broad range roaming area for a large abundance of wildlife. They're not gonna come down through here and go, oh, look, I'm gonna cross the river here at this bridge and then I'm going to go over that busy road and I'm gonna cross over there. I'm gonna to get to something that I can't get to over here. So the biodiversity in the uh, flora and fauna is the same, but the abundance of it and even the ability to record sightings because you have people that um, in these cleared areas that may not actually report, you know, seeing, I mean, everybody's going to see a magpie every day or something like that. So they're not going to ring up and report a sighting. But maybe if they see something, you know, like a monitor lizard, which they may not see all that often. And also with your brush turkeys, your bush turkeys, I mean, they're not going to... <laughs> They're abundant everywhere and nobody's actually going to ring up and go, oh, I saw a bush turkey. I mean, you have to also consider the circumstances in which re sightings are actually reported. If it's because people are trying to monitor and keep, like with koala sightings and everything, this is, and endangered and vulnerable species, this is something that is brought together as a community effort to try and make sure that we can monitor and see how many koalas or something like that are out there and whether we're seeing more or less, we need to be monitoring them. And these things are done so that we can know if their numbers are declining. But for the most part, people are not going to record seeing general um, flora and fauna except something that stands out maybe a tourist that's never seen something before rings up and reports sighting a koala because they've never seen a drop bear before <laughs> yeah, sorry so in essence the ability to record accurately this is just a general database of known sightings 
and it is certainly not all inclusive. It would actually require um, surveying the land and actually making, well, I have seen their tests, their traps and all their other things that they've set up. But I've also seen that where they want to stick all the houses through the wildlife corridor, it's like what when you gave the report to somebody to fill it out, did you leave out the page with all the sightings that were there? Because, you know, there's just a complete and conspicuous absence of animals identified through the current wildlife corridor that you identified. We didn't identify this for you. You identified it and said, we know this is a current wildlife corridor. But we don't want that corridor there. We want it over here now so we can build all our monstrosity houses. And one thing too, that if you haven't seen the video with Max Egan and Mark McMurtry that was done in April 2020 that I uploaded just recently again, in there he mentions that it's 300,000 per lot and yeah try and get that in Sydney eh? and dual occupancy I wonder if people did catch that when he said dual occupancy the intention is that every one of these lots these 392 lots is well could well be two houses on every lot dual occupancy that's what is promoted now you might also notice that Mark McMurtry said that and Adrian Brennock is also present there this is a promotion from the developers about the development so that's a little interesting thing that I haven't um, got to in any of the DA documents yet to see whether there is provision in there for dual occupancy of a single lot, which it was encouraged and promoted. And this was nearly a year ago now when Mark McMurtry and Adrian Brennock promoted to bring in the Max Egan fans you know, you make a down payment of 25000 or even a fi of $5,000. But to bring them in on the promise of 28 kilometres of sealed roads, even. And what's happened to the sealed roads? 28 kilometres of sealed roads has gone down to 26 and a half kilometres of very dangerous unsealed roads. I'm sorry, but, you know, the more people you get on unsealed roads, the more accidents you're going to ha have. And the, the level of people that intend to use these roads every day, you'll need a tow truck just to cater every day for the accidents that are going to happen. Or people are going to get bogged because, you know, the road hasn't been upgraded or graded this this year and it's all rutted and pitted out and, you know, you can't get anywhere and your car got stuck. And so these are issues that people are just not thinking about. These unsealed roads in themselves, for the level of traffic that they intend to put over it on a daily basis is completely unsafe for all things involved, the wildlife, the people, and um, yes, how much is it going to hurt when you have a car accident? Is it going to be one you survive? And you see, being on dirt roads too, if something jumps out in front, you know that you can't slam on your brakes because you've got no grip, you'll, you'll slide out. So the, the best advice would be to actually just keep driving. Drive through the animal and don't try and avoid it. So otherwise you could end up spinning your car out and uh, yeah, going head on into a tree which is only going to be six metres either side of the road that you're on because the roads are currently two metres wide. They need to make them six metres wide. They'll only be chopping down six metres wide worth of road. They're not going to be taking more because that's just going to cost them more money that they don't want to spend. So back to the wildlife corridor anyway. So in looking at what the actual environment and ecosystem is that they would 
disturb. You have to look at it in context of what is on the northern side of the Tweed River and Kyogre Road. You cannot include what is on the south side of that because you have got two natural bar or one natural barrier in the river and a man-made one very dangerous for animals and animals know it. So other than your birds that can fly safely past these barriers you're going to have a fairly limited um, ecosystem that is able to go past these natural and man-made barriers. So most of what you want to be looking at is going to be living in through these areas, not over on the other side. That's part of what lives within those barriers. So I put, I knew that I had to put in a 10 kilometer square area. So I decided what is the most acceptable and representative of the ecosystem that they would disturb if this development goes through. So I took it from, as you can see, the cross, the big cross I've got here. That's actually a 10 by 10 kilometer square radius. So I went in and I plugged in coordinates to give me that square or thereabouts because, um, as I said, one degree is the very minimum you can do to look at an area. So it's kind of difficult to refine it down. But when I did the one that planet on their coordinates, it came up with, let me just bring the overlay. So as you can see, I uh, screenshotted the, the map and I've just overlaid it and found the position to confirm exactly where their test area was. Now as you can see here, yes it does cover the whole development but it also is a much smaller part of the whole area that they're looking at. It's not the majority, it's the minority and it's not representing the ecosystem that they are a part of on this side of the road and the river but the bulk of the information is inclusive of what's in the other side of the road or past the river and past the road. And this, as I just explained, is more of a different ecosystem that has natural boundaries. So now I've, I've got all the test results that um, I showed you in the previous video where you just save results, it gives you a list. There are 712 species that are listed within this square. Now this is the square that I went for. As you can see it's a little bit further that way and not so much that way. That was because of the inability to refine it anymore. If I brought it down any more one this side, it would actually start to exclude the development boundaries. So this was the best square that I could get to represent the ecosystem that it is part of. Now let me just take some overlays off here. We'll take off the 712. No. Now you probably can't see it too well but there's there's the overlay of the wildlife corridor. I'm going a little bit further. So you've got the wildlife corridor that they propose through here and the current one that goes through here. Well the thing is that all of that would be wildlife corridor now so any taking of it is a reduction. But you can also see here that other than for the limitations of the mapping site itself. There's a small portion that is included past the natural barriers but other than that the the testing the report that I got was on an area where this is part of that natural environment so you would expect that this report would actually represent the greater part of the species and animals 
that do rely on this as their home. So once I had the two sets of results from the BioNet database, they give you an Excel S document. Excel S are very easy to transfer across into a database, a Microsoft database. And then once you do that, you can manipulate the information the way that you want so that I was then able to narrow the list down to those that were vulnerable, endangered and protected and those that had no classification whatsoever. Now I've actually done it on three different locations to sample to see the differences in the species count and how they're identified through the variations. If, um, oh hang on, I'll just show you. Uh, I did the seven, there was 743 species in this square, 783, if you can see that, it comes further south. And this is planets, which is down and over here. So as you can see, um, I got three different sets of values or lists and I can then compare the information. I decided at this stage that that one that I showed in the previous video was still too much on the other side of barriers and boundaries that would deter animals from going over there and I wanted to be more inclusive of what you would realistically find in that environment and the kind of species and animals that would be impacted by it. So, um, yes, I'll just bring that little chart back. So on here, what you're looking at here is that planets coordinates bring back results now of 3,438 records of 712 species. The area that I identified as being more significant to represent the environment that the development is part of returns a total of 9,366 records of 943 species. So there's a considerable increase in the number of records and also the number of species also dramatically increases once you start excluding what is on the side of the road and the river that the, most of these animals are not going to cross. And well, your plants aren't just going to grow legs and walk to the other side of the road, so you're including flora that is not in the area. So that's why I wanted to take it to the road and the river boundaries as much as I could, because they are natural boundaries for animals. You can, I, I can't in all realism say that past the river and past busy Kyogre Road that they are not natural barriers, that there is a break in the wildlife corridor. The corridor ends at the river and road. And there is another one on the other side that would do likewise, but I don't think they cross over too often because uh, that's roadkill area. And most animals are not going to try and cross rivers especially, you know, ones that can flood up. They're, they're trying to avoid these conditions, not find them. So when you look at the information that Planet have provided, there are 712 species that appear on the whole entire area. Of them, how many are endangered, protected and vulnerable? So then it was just a matter of actually going through and, yes, doing a bit of calculations. According to the data that came through that I just did, 10 endangered species, 302 protected and 47 vulnerable. Then I further broke it down into what kinds of animal, amphibian, reptiles, birds, insects and flora. 
Then I did likewise with the area that I believe better represents the ecosystem that the development is part of. I came up with a total of 943 species. That's over 200 more. And I found 21 endangered species, not 10. I found 339 protected species, not 302. And I found 52 vulnerable species, not 47. And if you look at how they're broken down, the only thing that didn't show increases was the one insect type, which is a moth. And all the others have got considerably more animals that are endangered, or animals and fauna, uh, flora and fauna, sorry, that are endangered, protected and vulnerable. So if you do actually take an accurate look at which area they will be impacting with the development, they are not going to be impacting past the river and the road. It will only be on this side of the river and the road. So in looking at that, they are impacting 943 species. And you can't say that they're not because any removal of habitat, any killing of animals in car accidents or that now they haven't got a safe home, their breeding practices go down, you killed them when you knocked down the tree even. You didn't know they were in there. None of this is acceptable. There are over 300 protected species in this area alone. And they have failed to even consider that these are protected. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of protected species within this area. And they intend to devastate so much of the habitat that takes away from the natural ecosystem. It's just, um, yeah, it's mind boggling. But if I was a town planner and I didn't want to make it look so bad, I would leave out the um, protected species and only focuses, focus on the ones that might cause a bit of trouble if we displace them, like the vulnerable and the endangered ones. And yes, when we do our little 10 square kilometre check, we can push it over into an environment that isn't applicable, covers a lot more grazing area and cleared spaces where there is going to be a natural reduction in sightings. Yes, you, you can see how did they play around and pick that particular location. As I said, if you are going to impact an environment, you have to look at the environment that it's contained within. And this side of the road and the river is its own contained environment and ecosystem. It may expand all the way up and around here. I mean, they would avoid the open areas except the grazers, but most of them are up around all this area. So anything coming out of here is going to take a big chunk out of an, an already existing wildlife reserve for both the plants and the animals. And it is, I mean, it's just such beautiful country through there. You know, it's so beautiful that tourists even pay, campers go to pay in, to camp in there to not hear any noises or traffic or radios or you know nothing like that and when you wake up in the morning there's so many sounds and it's the sounds of all the birds and the insects and everything that's going on around you in nature there's no cars there's no trucks there's no people hearing talking them you know in the background 
There's no doof music going that might be disturbing you. It is just so peaceful and quiet. But they intend to take all that away. And it's not very appealing when you go to these places and, well, what they intend to do at M Misty Mountains tourist accommodation. They intend to build houses around them. Can you imagine people going there to camp? And they're camping around people's houses. Who wants to go and camp in the bush and be surrounded by houses? You know, that you can see their lights on, you can hear them, cars coming in and out. No, when you go to the bush for seclusion, the only thing you want to hear is nature. And if 392 places are built, well, let's say double that for dual occupancy. That's going to be a lot of people, a lot of activity. You're not going to hear nature. You're going to hear your neighbour. You're going to hear all your neighbours going to and from, driving and talking and, oh, they're having a party tonight, are they? They've got friends over. No, you're not moving to the country for quiet and peace. But you will be displacing the quiet and peace of the natural ecosystem there. Anything that is proposed in this development is taking away from protected, vulnerable and endangered species. And it is part of a larger national parks and reserves and wildlife corridors. It should not even be considered just on its place within the natural scheme of these national parks and a larger wildlife reserve. So based on those two distinctions, I found 943 species to be more applicable than 712. And of the differences, I found that there were more mammals, more amphibians, more reptiles, more birds, and nearly double the flora. And of course there would be double the flora because if you consider that the flora is already taken away in these cleared paddocks, the biodiversity is a lot less. Whereas if you look at it in this area where there is no clearing, or it's actually bounced back from the clearing that has been done in areas, that there's a lot more biodiversity there. And so there's going to be a lot more flora species in that area that actually need to be considered. So that's just um, bringing forward two different perspectives of how to actually look at the flora and fauna information that has been presented with development application DA21-0010. Because when you look at it in the perspective of, all right, so what is the actual environment that you will impact? Where are natural boundaries, man-made boundaries? What is realistic in this scenario? And that's why, as I explained, I put in my little cross to go with what's realistic. This is a realistic area to survey a 10 kilometer square on because it covers more of the entire ecosystem that the development intends to impact. What the development does over here is not going to impact what's over here already in its enclosed environment unless it actually forces animals to try and cross the river and the road more of them get killed and then the few that do make it over are competing with the resources for animals that are already there on this side. So whatever they do, they are going to be displacing animals and making them compete in the other natural ranges of species. Like, you know, they say they're not going to take away from anything, but all right, so say all these animals decide, no, we're not going here, they're going to go over here now. Well, that's empty, they can just move in because there's no other animals there. Yeah, plenty of room for them. No, there is already 
um, a thriving population because it is nicely balanced. If you take away a huge chunk of habitat, it's going to create an imbalance. And with those imbalances, there is going to start becoming problems with competition and we could start to see declines in numbers because there are too many competing for the same things. And how much of the destruction of, you know, any animals that actually will eat the plants, because you're going to put more of these into the environment, how many more of the plants then will be overburdened and not be able to maintain the habitat for those species? No, once you start to overburden an ecosystem and it becomes unbalanced, that's when one problem then just creates another, another and another. So I do not see how they can successfully relocate this because it is already part, all of it. The whole entire development is already part of a natural wildlife corridor. Not just the part that they say that is down through there. The whole lot is. And you can see that with all their little, hang on, I'll put their little thing on. All right, which hang on. Sorry, if you click to open up a whole folder, everything in there opens up. So from their animal survey, there's abundance of wildlife all around, except through here, as I pointed out before. So it is clear that this whole area is a current wildlife habitat. It's not a corridor through here. This is all habitat. You intend to create a corridor that would push animals over that way so that you can use this whole area as your habitat and stick up, well, are you going to allow dual occupancy? I'm going to have to check that out a little bit further. If anybody has seen that and noticed that in anywhere of the DA documents where they may have said, yes, dual occupancy will be permitted, but also if it's permitted by council, but we also know they don't actually need permission from council to do anything. They'll just do it as they want. And even Mark McMurtry said that in the previous video that I uploaded that was done nearly a year ago, or just over a year ago. They want to do things as peacefully as possible, but they will do what they want. They're not going to let anybody stop them. And they're not going to let a little thing like laws stop them, because laws don't apply to him. He's a tribal person, and he's got tribal rights, and he never gave them up 250 years ago. Uh. So anyway, that's my little bit of information on what I've discovered in looking at the two different locations and what species are in it. There is a vast difference between the species that Planet have recorded and the ones that I have identified in this unique environment on the other side of the river and the road through the whole national parks and reserves area. If you wanted a copy of the database so you can manipulate your own information to get the, to see what kind of species come up in certain things, um, those that already know and have my email address, just drop me an email. I'm happy to share these things that I have done with you. <laughs> but you know what? Considering what bad job Planet had done on all this stuff, I'm not going to upload it publicly so that they can correct all their work by using mine. <laughs> and on that note, I'll say catch you next time. Bye.